First up, Adam and Jamie tackle an internet sensation that's causing an A-list viewer extreme vexation. Hey. Hey, uh, we have a very exciting myth today from an unbelievably special viewer. Who's that? None other than James Cameron. You mean that guy that went to the bottom of the Marianas Trench? That's the guy. I was thinking of him more as a movie director, but yes, that's the guy. So, James Cameron also directs movies, is what you're telling me? Yes, he does. Really? So what's his myth? Actually, I think we should talk to him. OK. Hey, James. Hey. Could you tell Jamie what you told me? Sure. So for the last few months since I released Titanic in 3D, I've been getting dozens of emails every day saying that Rose is a selfish so-and-so and Jack's an idiot. Who are Rose and Jack? Two main characters of the movie. All right, Jamie, the end of the film Titanic, Rose and Jack are distributed among the detritus of the sunken ship, and Rose is perched on a piece of wood, and Jack is not. Because there wasn't enough buoyancy to support both of them? Right, and Jack makes the ultimate sacrifice, and he dies so that Rose can live. Right, so anyway, these thousands of fans think that I got it wrong, and that they both could have been supported by the board, and they both could have lived, so this is what I want you guys to test. Wait, so you made a movie about the Titanic? Yes. Why would you do that? We already know how it ends. He doesn't get out much, does he? No, he doesn't. OK, so I need you guys to find out who's right, these so-called fans or my movie. OK, it seems to me the place we start is with the buoyancy. The question is, could the board possibly have supported both Rose and Jack? I agree, but the second issue is about survival in those freezing conditions. You mean, if they both could have died regardless of the board? Exactly. Let's say I get started doing some small-scale testing with a mini board and a mini Rose and Jack. And why don't I start to prep for some hypothermia tests? And I'll get back to sweeping up. Awesome. So the epic full-scale Jack and Rose reenactment comes later. Let's see. Here we can both get on this thing. Because this titanic tale won't set sail until it's been tested in safer waters, where the guys opt for an efficient division of labor. Jamie's taking charge of how to quantify and replicate the hero's hypothermia and grumble about the lack of logic in love, while Adam's cutting things down to size. OK, the myth in miniature. So what are you going to do? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to start by playing with dolls. Uh, I'm going to make some very accurate dolls of Rose and Jack, accurate both in terms of their size, but also in their weight. <laughs> And then I'm going to put them on a piece of wood that is exactly the same type of wood as the original. Right, so white oak. Yes, and basically put that in a tub full of salty water and see what happens. And prove my movie was right. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. With Adam's quarter-sized dolls cut and sewn, they're ready to put on some weight. Exactly how much is kind of clever. Now, given that this guy is one quarter my size, does that make him one quarter my weight? No! Let me explain, because most people get this wrong. This is a two-inch cube of aluminum. This is exactly one quarter scale, a half-inch cube of aluminum. This one weighs 352 grams. This one weighs 5.5 grams. Actually, just a shade under. How do we get there from there? Well, what you do is you scale by what's called the cube root. That means three separate times, because there are three separate dimensions, length, width, and height. You take 352 and divide it by four, divide it by four again, and divide it by four one more time, and you get 5.5 grams. Isn't that cool? And to achieve the correctly scaled weight, Adam fills the dolls with beans and uh, knowledge. Oh, ready, Jack? I'm going to fill your head full of knowledge. Learn that stuff. Yeah, good for you. Next up, Adam brings the same scaling rigor to the key prop piece. Using the same type of wood, he accurately scales each dimension by a quarter. And with a final coat of theatrical magic, perfect. Adam is just a bathtub full of salty seawater, short of being ready. Excellent. We are at a proper level of ocean sea. All right, we're getting ready for a quarter scale test. I've got my piece of wood that Rose floated on, and I've got a scale weighted Rose. We should see identical behavior to the full size one. Here we go. Rose lies down on it. Oh, oh, that actually, wow, 
In the movie, you can see that it's lapping on most of the board, and that's exactly what we're getting here. So far, so good. Adam's eye for detailed and mathematically accurate scaling has paid off. Now, what about the myth itself? Could Jack have jumped aboard? Here we go. Jack and Rose. Nope. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They're about sinking. Hold on. It doesn't look like they can stay afloat. That means this maiden voyage myth is on thin ice, and the movie's looking like the real deal. Science is on my side. So what we see in the movie, where he tries to climb on and the thing's just to tip over, seems like it's totally accurate. There they go. Well, it seems that all the time I spent making my dolls exactly one quarter scale to their counterparts and using the exact same wood for the wood piece has paid off. We've learned some important things in scale. First and foremost, it would seem that all the behavior we see out of this piece of wood in the movie is accurate to reality. It is just barely buoyant enough to hold Rose's body out of the water. It also appears that it is not buoyant enough to keep Rose and Jack's body out of the water. Now, of course, Damien and I are gonna experiment with this in full scale. Yep, it's too early to call it yet. There they go. Because the problem is not just about buoyancy. To find out if the film failed in the survivability stakes, Adam and Jamie will examine every aspect of cold water endurance. It's alive! Enter Thermal Man. There it goes. Oh! <laughs> Adam and Jamie, cyborg midwives. The question is, could Rose and Jack have survived on that piece of wood until rescue came? And it all boils down to how long the human body can stave off hypothermia. Now, we know medically how long the human body can stave off hypothermia if it's immersed in water. But if you're out of the water in wet clothes and the air is the same temperature, how long then? Is there a difference? My intuition tells me that there is, but that's what we are testing for. Gotta add a little more North Atlantic. First, we're gonna immerse our fully clothed dummy in 29 degree Fahrenheit water and see how long it takes for it to reach hypothermia. Can I just tell you I'm so glad it's not me doing this test? Then we're gonna pull him out, warm him up to his normal temperature, and put him in his wet clothing in 29 degree Fahrenheit air and see how long it takes for him to reach hypothermia there. So, that's the cold bath plan. But is it accurate? So what can you tell me about the climatic conditions Rose and Jack were facing? Well, it turns out there were really good records from the night of the sinking, and the uh, water temperature would have been hovering, you know, just below freezing, so around 28, 29 degrees Fahrenheit. Hence the icebergs. Yeah, exactly. But what's interesting is the air temperature was almost identical. So uh, it was about 33 degrees at the time of the collision, but uh, by the time... By the time of Rose's rescue, uh, about 3 a.m., it had come down to you know, 29 degrees. So your 29 degree comparison would be right on. Excellent. So with the director's seal of approval, Jack is warm to human body temperature and ready for action. Let's go. The conduction of this test is gonna be pretty straightforward. Jamie, with a little assistance, is going to dunk our dummy in the cold North Atlantic water. I will be monitoring his temperature drop every 30 seconds until he's dead. And after 10 minutes, with Thermo Boy's temperature dropping significantly, we catch a rare glimpse of Jamie's tender side. How you doing there, little buddy? Real tender. Sweet cheeks. As you move towards 96 degrees, you're shivering. As you move towards 91 degrees, you're shivering violently and uncontrollably. All this is a good thing, because that's what your body is doing to keep you warm and alive. As you go beyond 91 degrees, you stop shivering. And that's a bad thing. Ow! That water's cold. Our body is at 85 degrees at this point. He is on a solid trajectory towards dying, experiencing almost full immobility and stupor. Yep, and the key symptom at this stage of hypothermia, loss of motor control, means Jack, unable to hang onto the board, would have drowned by now. What's your diagnosis, Dr. Heideman? He's dead. A diagnosis reached long before the 63-minute rescue time. So far, so good for the survival times portrayed in the movie. Remember, kids, the only difference between screwing around and science is writing it down. Now, with Thermal Man warmed back up to body temperature, what about survival on the board? 
Three, two, one, here we go. Out of the water, in 29 degree air, would Rose have survived to die warm in her bed? If Jack could have got on board, would there have been a happy ending to the biggest disaster movie of all time? This is interesting. In 23 minutes, our guy out of the water is at 90.7 degrees. At the same time, in the cold water, he was at 90 degrees. So we're pretty much almost neck and neck between both tests. So, in terms of retaining heat, there's only the slightest advantage to being on the board, except in one crucial respect. I should point out that Thermo Boy has just passed the 85 degree mark, which is the point that he would be in a stupor in any mobile. Now, that means that if he was in the water, he'd probably drown. But he's not. He's on a board. He's in air. So he's got kind of a grace period here where he's not dead yet. He's got a few degrees to go before that happens. He might get rescued. Yep, below 82 degrees, death is a deadly certainty. But at the time of rescue, Thermal Man's core temperature was above that. So again, the movie is accurate. Rose would have been alive just barely when the lifeboat arrived. So what do we take away from all this? Well, if you're in sub-zero water and weather, the difference between being in that water or out of it and wet is pretty small, but there is an advantage to being out of the water. And critically, once you pass 85 degrees core body temperature, you can no longer move your limbs. If you're in the water when that happens, you are nothing but a weight heading to the bottom of the sea. If you are on your board or boat or whatever you've got, you might just last until rescue. Quite simply, Jack's only chance of survival right. is to get on the board. But could he? Oh, oh, There's oh. only one way to answer that question. Oh. Adam and Jamie Don't call me Rose. are getting wet and intimate with science. We've had this thing carefully crafted to be an accurate replica of what was in the movie based on designs provided by the Maritime Museum of Nova Scotia. It's the same material, same size, it's what we're going to use. Next, it's over to the wardrobe department to get dressed for the occasion. Let's go swimming. In addition to this, I'm going to be wearing this cork and canvas replica life preserver, which Adam sewed up, and it's exactly like what they had in the movie. Indeed, it's a period accurate piece, made of the same materials and with the same buoyancy as the one Rose was wearing. You ready to start this test? OK, Rose. I mean, Jamie. All right. Let's see if we can both get on this thing. Will Adam and Jamie's titanic tail be consigned to Davy Jones' locker? Jack's first attempts to get aboard the board seem very similar to the movie. The board does appear to be only made for one. But once they stabilize and get their balance, things are looking up. All right, all right, baby steps. Baby steps. So when I first got on, it felt anything but stable. Just like the movie and the small scale test we did, it felt like it could tip at any moment. It's holding us up out of the water, mostly. If we were in nearly freezing temperatures in danger of passing out, that would be a real issue. So I had an idea. You're wearing a life jacket. What say it, Rose? Spread some of the buoyancy around. Let's put it underneath this thing and get every bit we can out of it. And it's the MacGyver-style tweak that really puts the nail in this myth's coffin. The additional buoyancy has made a massive difference. They're no longer floundering around, but sitting pretty. In fact, so pretty that Rose is ready to nap her way to the 63-minute rescue. 80% of my body is out of the water and in the air. Yeah, same here. If we can hold this sort of stationary, I think we're golden. Jamie, we're almost there. 15 seconds. Well, you know, however noble Jack's intentions might have been, sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. Hang on, Rose! With all we've learned, I think Jack's death was needless. <laughs> Don't call me Rose. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> The key fact is, we're rescued. We totally made it. On top of the board, with most of our bodies out of the water in 63 minutes. All right, James, we have some good news and we have some bad news. All right, give me the good news. OK. Well, the good news is the movie got it right as far as hypothermia. Jack would have drowned, and Rose would have been able to hang on long enough to be rescued. The bad news is, based on our experiments, we have to find that they both could have survived on that board. Really? There were a couple of things, and the first was that 
we were able to retie the life preserver that Rose was wearing underneath the board, and that gave it more points. And we were able to prop up our bodies on the board so that most of our body mass was actually outside of the water. Based on that, we got to say, this is plausible. Rosa Jack could have survived. I think you guys are missing the point here. The script says Jack dies. He has to die. Maybe we screwed up. The board should have been a little tiny bit smaller, but the dude's going down. <laughs> I can't argue with that. No.